So it's, it's not actually a white cat, but I might do this through the entire presentation, <laughs> since I am a bald, evil person. Um, actually, that'll make it hard to turn the slide, so let me put Groff back where he belongs. <laughs> ah, don't fall. Uh, good morning. Thank you for all um, skipping um, synagogue and joining me on a Saturday morning. Um, okay, so all the other three Jews in the room will get the joke. Um, I'm going to talk about the realities of DTrace on FreeBSD. And uh, this is work that comes out of work I'm doing with uh, at least one other person in the room, uh, John Anderson, who talked about uh, Capsicum yesterday, but also Brian Kidney, who gave a version of this talk at BSD CAM, Arun Thomas, Robert Watson, and a team of people at the University of Cambridge, Memorial University, and BAE. Um, so a quick overview of the talk, um, which I'll just go backwards. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of history. Uh, I'll talk about motivation, you know, why we're doing this work. Um, then I'll talk about some recent improvements we've made to DTrace, some of which have gone directly into the FreeBSD tree, some of which have yet to hit the tree. Uh, then I'll talk a bit about how people actually use DTrace. Um, and then I'll talk about our future plans for what, we, what we're going to do with DTrace. So um, quick demographic question. Uh, how many people in the room have actually used DTrace to debug something? So I'm going home, and you all actually know how this works. No, I'm just kidding. Um, now, how many of you actually have built tools on top of DTrace that consume DTrace and present it to people who are not kernel programmers? Much smaller number of people. There's a reason for that. We're going to talk about that during the talk. Um, so let's do the obligatory history. Um, so DTrace was first developed by Sun before 2005. In fact, the USENIX paper on the tracing system shows up at a USENIX ATC in 2005. Um, it was ported to FreeBSD by John Burrell in 2008. And it has also been ported to Mac OS and, originally, and shows up first in OS 10.5. Um, it's been maintained separately, for the most part, ever since with some cross-patching. So that means that uh, when people have made changes to what was Open Solaris or now Illumos, <clears throat> um, or people made improvements on FreeBSD or uh, sometimes on Mac OS, those patches have gone across, but that has been an ad hoc process, usually cherry-picked or because people know each other in the community. Um, there has been, uh, since a certain thing that I'm going to talk about in a moment, um, no real coherent uh, development of DTrace across all the operating systems. Slide. There we go. So I'd like to reference um, something that happened recently. I'd like a moment of silence for Solaris because Oracle killed it. Um, but I will not go as far as Brian. I will say that I agree with Brian's comments on Oracle, but I will also point out that that had to be put up at the beginning of his talk when he talked about what he thought about Oracle. So I'm not going to add those things to my talk. Anyway, um, so let's talk about some motivations. Why are we doing this work? Um, why do we decide to pick up DTrace? Why are we? trying to move forwards? Why are we doing all the crazy work it requires to um, maintain the code base and then move it forwards? Um, so DTrace, when it was built, was quite an, a good innovation. Many people had built tracing systems before, some of which worked along the same lines. Uh, but they didn't include all of the features that DTrace put into uh, Solaris. So when DTrace was built in the early 2000s, there had, of course, you know, if you get a room full of kernel developers and you're like, oh, DTrace is the first tracing system, they're like, well, you know, on the Atlas in 1953, we had a tracing system that we put into Multics. I'm sure someone did. Um, but DTrace had some very important components that made it a really compelling feature uh, for both software developers. And generally, I, when I say software developers, I mean people who program in C and C++. Um, later on, people who program in things like Python uh, and sort of scripted languages, and Java, of course, because it comes from Sun, the people who made Java. You can blame them for that, too. Um, but it had several components that made it more compelling than simply adding a tracing system, uh, yet another tracing system to an operating system kernel. First of all, um, it was quite good at having very little to zero overhead when not in use. And it's really important to put that caveat at the bottom. Um, DTrace is really good at staying out of the way if you don't turn it on. You, know, you turn it on, but you know you're doing work, so it does get in the way. Um, but it also had a somewhat powerful scripting language that came with it, which made it 
theoretically possible for people who were not C and C++ uh, or programmers or kernel developers to write scripts that could tell them about the state of their system. And that combined with you know, the, the actual code that went into the operating system and went into uh, the libraries, that's what made it compelling. It's a combination of tracing and the ability to make that tracing available to a wider group of people. And if you want to see more about that, you should see some of Brendan Gregg's talks when he talks about the things that he did with the D language. Um, so one of our motivations in working on D-Trace is to continue to improve the state of tracing on large systems. We've got this extant um, system. It's quite a good system. It needs many improvements. It has its own, you know, like any piece of software, has its faults. Uh, but our goal is to make it so that, um, you know, big systems can be traced. Um, we also want to expand tracing into distributed systems, and I'll explain that motivation on the next slide. Um, but, you know, if you want to make something more difficult, you add a second computer, right? And most data centers have more than two computers now, so that means you've made it many, many, many times more difficult. So one of our goals in our D-Trace work is to take the things that we're able to do and express on a local system, on a single host, uh, with D-Trace, and then make it possible to express that over a range of hosts. Um, and actually, not just hosts, but more devices, which I'll talk about in a second. <clears throat> uh, another motivation, and this is something that Robert Watson at the University of Cambridge and myself and actually a couple other people in the room have helped with, um, we realize that a tracing system gives us a very powerful tool for teaching. Right? So for those of you who took undergraduate operating systems, which probably is half the people in the room, I won't even make you raise your hands, um, you know, operating systems generally are taught to people when they're still taught because I will tell you that many universities don't teach operating systems, and that's going to be bad for the world, um, that when they are taught, you have a couple of different models. You either make a really trivial change to an existing system, that's less common now. Uh, you're given a toy system to play with, uh, but generally you are not given a million lines of source code 16 weeks, and the ability to look through that source code in any meaningful way. And a really good tracing system, in particular D-Trace with the language, allows us to, in less time than that, because the, the trimesters at Cambridge are something like eight weeks long, allows us to create teaching material that can give students, including undergraduates, a um, good horizontal view of the things that happen in an operating system. So we can effectively teach um, about complex systems. And as we all know in this room, systems continue to become more complex. So we think that this tracing technology is really important from that point of view. Um, we want it to be production ready. Well, it turns out that Sun did a really good job of making it production ready. In fact, every time I teach about D-Trace, I challenge the students to crash the kernel. Like, I defy you to make D-Trace crash the kernel. And in the last two years of teaching about this, no one has done it. So. Uh, you cannot call panic from D-Trace, so you could try. Bastard. <clears throat> um, don't give away the answer. Anyway, so production-ready system, that's what we want. Um, you know, there, like I said, there are many different types of tracing systems that people have built over time. Um, for those of you who have interacted with, I'm going to get in trouble for this, graduate student software, um, <laughs> sometimes it's production-ready, and sometimes it just got them their PhD, and then they were done. Uh, we want to do it in open source, and the licensing on D-Trace has always been mostly compatible um, with the BSD license. So they used something called the CDDL, and we have not felt the need yet to relicense that. Okay, so let me tell you my real motivation. Uh, this is my real motivation um, for wanting to have distributed tracing. And uh, so this is a scene from the end of the movie Reservoir Dogs. It is one of my favorite films. That probably tells you too much about me. Um, you'll notice that all three of the characters still standing are holding handguns, and they're pointing them at each other. I will not play the clip, because then someone will have to watch the clip with the lawyer, and that's not going to go well. So you're welcome. Um, but this is a crisis meeting. So I have worked in environments happily where no one has a handgun, though I'm currently, I realize, in Virginia and outside of DC, so that may change. Um, where you have uh, a group of people who are trying to solve a problem. Usually they're trying to solve it under pressure, 
uh, they all have their own interests, um, and they all have their own view of the system. So imagine you have a large cluster in a data center. You've got 1,000 nodes, or 2,000 nodes, or 4,000 nodes, and they're running something like a Hadoop uh, cluster, or they're running some sort of clustered algorithm. Um, generally, you have three groups involved. You have um, the programmers who wrote the code that's running on top of the cluster, they're, um, they're played by Harvey Keitel. He's on the right. Um, then you have the people who admin the systems. The, you know, generally, we'll call them systems administrators or the DevOps people. Uh, the people who keep the servers up and running, uh, they're played by the guy in the white jacket. Um, and then you have the people who connect all the things together, which is your network team. Uh, and they're played by the guy in the blue jacket this way. Um, and there's a problem. Usually, the problem is expressed in the following way. The system is slow. All right, that's an excellent bug report. Please write that down and send it into the ticketing system. Um, <clears throat> or the system is stopped or some other bizarre component. And you eventually get into one of these crisis meetings where everyone believes that it's not their fault. And they're gonna prove it's not their fault by pointing a handgun at the other guy's head. Um, turns out there's one other person involved. That's the person who actually wants the data out. That's the person lying mostly dead on the floor. Uh, in a pool of blood. So um, we'd like to avoid these kind of crisis meetings. And the reason these happen, I will point out, is because there is not a good, coherent way to answer the following question in a distributed system. Who did what to whom and when? Now, I'll point out that I learned that from my mother, since she had eight kids, and that was generally yelled at one of us at some point because there was a fight. Um, but it turns out it's also good advice for distributed systems debugging. Um, so, you know, the systems people have all the data from the operating system, right? So they've got NetStat or IOSTAT or, you know, if they're using DTrace, the records they've collected from the system. <clears throat> the programmers may or may not use a debugger. If they're programmers from a certain operating system, they don't believe in debuggers. They've got printf. Um, and then the networking people have network statistics from the network switches, and those all three of those sets of data do not correlate, right? You know, packets in, packets out doesn't tell me anything about the storage system. It doesn't tell me about the requests that went across the network. So my goal, or uh, one of my motivations coming to the project where we were working, was to avoid a situation in which there were three people with handguns and a guy lying dead on the floor. Um, by the way, this scene ends really badly. Go watch the movie. Um, I'll give that away. So. Um, motivation for a dis you know, good distributed tracing system is that we actually have <clears throat> information not just from hosts, but eventually from network switches and anything else, the storage system, um, anything else in a distributed system that can make it easier for us to debug problems and to answer the question of why is the system slow. Um, so, motivation. Um, so I've referred to we a few times. I'll talk very briefly uh, about the uh, research project that I'm involved in where we're using quite a bit of DTrace. Uh, this is called CADETS, the Causal Adaptive Distributed and Efficient Tracing System. Every once in a while I get it wrong and I say effective. Um, the idea here is that we have a security problem we wish to track through a distributed system. Um, and we do that, you know, generally you have something like an analyst, um, which the analyst will decide what they want to look at. You know, please, please, O oh Oracle of the distributed system, um, tell me about these particular events. Um, then we are building the tech, we and cadets are building the technology that collects and instruments that data, um, tries to reduce it, because if you collect everything that happens on every machine in a distributed system, you will have a lot of data. Um, and then we feed it into um, a system called Opus, developed also uh, by a research group, an independent research group at the University of Cambridge, uh, who we've worked very closely with, to uh, analyze and refine that data down to something that you could give to a human analyst. <clears throat> and when we're talking about human analysts, we mean we're not talking about someone who's a kernel programmer. We're talking about someone who looks at uh, security issues all day and can try and decide this is really a threat, this is not a threat, this thing was compromised, this was not compromised. Um, so, so there are two 
areas in which we're doing this work, I'm going to refer very briefly to some of the work done on something called Loom, which Jonathan Anderson and his group at Memorial are working on. Uh, this is instrumentation that goes into the compiler. Uh, what I'm going to talk about more today uh, is the things we've done to Dtrace to make Dtrace more amenable to a system like this, to a system where we're doing distributed collection of data. And yes, that weird little pony really is the Dtrace mascot. All right, so um, let's get these both all in here. Here we go. Um, so like, as I mentioned, Loom is an, uh, an instrumentation, instrumentation technology uh, driven from LLVM that I will not go into in depth in part because, well, Jonathan should do it at some point. Um, but we are using Dtrace uh, to do full system, scriptable full system dynamic tracing. And uh, we have someone who's actually worked on doing distributed Dtrace taking the dtrace uh, system and actually being able to distribute it across a number of nodes. And then we're using FreeBSD, which in this room should be fairly obvious. Um, so how do we use dtrace uh, in the project? Um, so we leverage dtrace for distributed instrumentation. Um, that means that all of the nodes in our system, and if you, if you imagine, again, uh, the cluster example of a you know 1,000 nodes or 2,000 nodes or 5,000 nodes uh, in our in a distributed systems cluster, uh, we will be able, we can actually do dtrace on all of those and then control them from a central point or points. Um, so what does that mean? Um, so I asked at the beginning how many people had debugged problems with dtrace, right? So the, the typical usage of dtrace for the most part, and this is not completely true because people like Fishworks did something similar to what I'm talking about. When Fishworks was part of Sun. They built their own storage clustering system. If you've ever seen a really cool video of a guy screaming at hard disks, that was the Fishworks stuff, and that was Brendan Gregg actually screaming at hard disks. Um, but generally, people do not turn dtrace on and leave it on. Uh, they don't just have it collect data over time. Uh, some people will. They'll use it for telemetry and metrics. Um, we're not just leaving it on. Um, we're leaving it on and we're collecting a ton of data, um, you know, gigabytes per, you know, like hour or something like that. We collect quite a bit of data uh, because in order to really answer the question, who did what to whom and when, um, you want to be able to see nearly all of the events that happen on the system. Actually, what you'd like is total transparency, but it turns out that that will be expensive. Now, the nice thing about doing this in a DARPA research project is I've never gone into a place where I said, well, what if it's 100% inefficient? Like, like, what if it doubles your runtime? And they said, yeah, okay. I'm like, all right, okay, ready to go. Um, it also means that from a security standpoint, when we talk about it as a security technology, some of the protections can be used against us, some of the things that Dtrace is doing to protect the operating system. Remember I said, you know, none of my students, except now it turns out Benno, um, have crashed, uh, Dtrace, well, that's because Dtrace does a bunch of things that I'll talk about to protect the operating system. But those protections in a system that's trying to collect all of the data all the time can be used against the system. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, <laughs> wow, I, my, I think that might be the most understated statement in the entire presentation. Some improvements are necessary. When I thought someone was about to ask a question. So, um, nice thing about doing this particular DARPA project, it is all not secret because, well, it would be hilarious to try and get me a clearance. Um, but beyond that, uh, it also means we get to do everything in open source. So if you want to see the changes we're making before they hit the FreeBSD tree, if you really want to use, you know, the head of the FreeBSD tree is the bleeding edge. If you want the bleeding, bleeding edge, or the gushing edge, I don't know how that would work, um, that would be in our repo on uh, GitHub. So cadets FreeBSD. So some recent dtrace improvements. What are some of the things that we improved in dtrace to try and make things like distributed tracing or always on collection work? Um, or to make it easier for people who are building scripts? Um, so one of the things that, and, and this might be the first thing I did, and this has not yet hit the tree because it requires me to add libxo to uh, the dtrace command, which is going to make at least five people yell at me 
And I would say I don't like to be yelled at, but that's clearly not true. <laughs> um, machine readable output. So when DTrace was built, it was very, and it still is, very kernel programmer, C programmer, texty, outputty kind of stuff. So, I mean, it made beautiful ASCII graphs. That's not a sentence, right? Like beautiful ASCII graphs, those, that's not real, right? That's, that's a bunch of at signs came out and you thought that was enough. Um, so because the output is pretty much unstructured text for the most part, that makes it really hard to build tools, right? So, and I would argue that that's the reason only one person in the audience said they'd built some sort of tool on top of the output of DTrace. Um, what you need to build better tools in particular, if you want to build telemetry tools or debugging tools or things that are showing the runtime performance of a system, is to have something that's machine parsable, machine readable output. And so uh, by using libxo, we can actually output JSON, which is probably the most common format that tools will pull in. But you know, libxo also generates XML, so if you like XML, <laughs> uh, you can do that. And it generates HTML, which I guess I could put into a web page, but I'd rather pull my hair out. Um, so machine readable output. Um, then another thing we added, and this was done by Robert Watson, who created the original audit system. Uh, instead of uh, going and trying to instrument every function boundary trace point, of which there are 50,000 in the kernel, uh, we already had a system that looked at many of the things we cared about. This sort of trying to understand who did what to whom and when. And that's the audit provider, um, the audit system. And so uh, within DTrace, since most of you have used it, you know many of these terms, um, each collection of trace points or collection of information you, you want to get a hold of, like system calls or function boundary trace points or information about the network protocols or information about the storage system, <clears throat> they're rolled up into these things called providers. And as you know, one of the things that is great about DTrace is the process by which you create new providers is well, well is a strong word, is documented, um, and there are good examples. So Robert went and created this audit provider, and the audit provider connects the audit subsystem to DTrace, and then as audit records are generated, like you know, Bob went and opened file X on you know in directory Y, um, we collect that information, and that's part of the basis of our data collection for when we're trying to answer that question. By the way, I would like to make another aside. Um, how many people believe that files exist? Yeah. Only a couple of you, there, because you're really wrong if you believe that. <laughs> um, files and file names are really not a good way to build a, an overall tracing system because it is far too easy to change those. Uh, it turns out that there are people in the, um, security community who that's really how they try to track what's going on. And those of us who do OSs kind of keep saying, no, really, that's don't depend on that. Those are just sort of name ideas in the mind of God. Like they're sort of names that may or may not stay. Don't use those. Um, and so what we've done is, uh, as part of the work that was done uh, for the cadets work, uh, added UUIDs to pretty much everything in the system. Now. That is not in the head of the tree because we've not made any measurements of the impact of having a UUID on everything that ever exists. And our client doesn't mind 100% overhead, but I bet people who consume FreeBSD do. Um, I talk, uh, talked a little bit about performance, or I've mentioned it a couple of times. We're starting to do quite a bit of performance analysis um, of the underlying system and of the compiled language. So when you create one of your D probes with a bit of uh, action script or you know, D script, um, that is run through a compile phase. And that compile phase is not completely efficient. So uh, we're looking at various parts of the system and trying to improve the performance of the system overall so that we can collect more data and so that eventually it is not a huge amount of overhead to collect that data. So that's being done by various people. Um, so at least three different graduate students have looked at that problem, and I'm sure that we will continue to look at it as we move forwards. Um, right. Oh, <laughs> this is fun. Documenting the internals. So uh, the folks at Sun 
really awesome kernel developers, really good programmers, and actually put in amazing comments and stopped there. So if you were to want to do, for instance, a clean room re-implementation of Dtrace, uh, you would need something a little more specific on how it worked. So one of the things we've started doing, and actually this is one of my tasks, is uh, effectively writing a design and implementation of Dtrace by writing a Dtrace specification. Um, and you know, to most programmers, they're like, we don't care about the documents you're writing. I'm like, no, you're really gonna care eventually because this is gonna be really important. Um, in particular, not just what happens, but also how and why. So let's look at a little bit of machine-readable output. This is traditional output from current Dtrace. Um, you know, tell me whenever I hit uh, write syscall, this is a really simple one-liner. Um, it's actually not super interesting, but it shows our point. Um, instead of having to write, and I will point out that the scripts that consumed, until recently the scripts that consumed Dtrace were mostly Perl and some corn shell, because bad ideas come in droves, but I got rid of all the corn shell. <clears throat> um, so if you look at the second set of output, it, may or may not make you throw up, um, but it does make it possible to use something that consumes JSON to turn that into something that could be an object in a program, which is something we really care about. So this will be coming soon to FreeBSD. Um, let's go. So I mentioned the D language. So when the D language was produced um, and Dtrace was produced, um, you know, it was definitely far better than anything that you could get certainly in open source, possibly in closed source. Um, but there are some improvements we would like. Now, some of those improvements uh, need to be built in a very careful way because some of the limitations of D and Dtrace come down to these protections of the kernel. So um, D scripts and D data collection happens in the kernel. So the D language has no loops. Now, how many of you program for an entire day without writing a loop. Yeah, I thought so. Um, so there are no loops. The only, um, until recently, the only branching operator was a ternary operator. Um, and there's a good reason for this. If you shove a loop in the kernel and you make a mistake in your loop and that loop never ends, you know, I mean, we all know that you could write a program to check your program. Nope, that doesn't work either. It's, no, Turing doesn't work that way. So um, in the original D language and in the current D language as it exists um, in Illumos, FreeBSD, and Mac OS X, there are no loops. And this makes a lot of programs annoying to write. Um, the other thing is the ternary operator. Um, and the ternary, you know, we can all program with ternary operators, but really I want an if block. And the, um, the interpreted assembly language looks a little bit like DPF, generated by uh, the D compiler actually has branch instructions. They're just never exposed, right? You could have branches, but you know, branches can lead to loops, loops lead to the end of the universe, bad things happen. Um, so, uh, you know, D currently, C-like language supports C operators, structured like awk. If you look at D, you're like, somebody really had a thing for awk. Like, they really loved awk. Which is fine, awk is cool. Um, you have thread, oh, tread, and clause local variables. Um, there are not subroutines in D. There are subroutines available to D. There's two different things there. So one of the other improvements that we'd like to add to the language are subroutines and modules, because it's 2017. <laughs> and modules are old by now. Um, so things we actually have added already. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I have a thing for the network stack. Um, I like networking, so I started adding a bunch of things to, uh, to make network uh, probes easier. Um, so we can now, um, in Solaris, their network buffering is different. In FreeBSD, we have a complicated network um, data structure called the mbuff. Um, it's complicated because they can be chained and they can have data in them and data outside of them. And, things like that. Um, so I created a single, sub, single new subroutine, copy out mbuff. Um, it will be useful mostly in the BSD-derived stacks. I'll talk about portability towards the end, of the, the end of the talk. But anything derived from BSD still uses mbuffs. Um, 
and I have an example here which should show up on the slide. There we go. Um, so uh, copy.mbuff is able to, you know, using something which is inside of dtrace called tracemem, uh, this is an example where I'm looking at the packets that are coming through TCP input. So the data at the bottom should look very familiar. In particular, the zeroth byte. Who knows why the zeroth byte is what it is? Raise your hand. That's a room full of IP people, excellent. IPv4, if you wanna know where the beginning of the IP packet is, you always look for the byte 4.5, because it always works. Um, <laughs> V6, have a nice day. Um, but anyway, so uh, this is an example just of using copy out mbuff to grab an mbuff, irrespective of where its data is, and show it to the programmer. So this is pretty useful for doing things like um, simple packet captures without using PCAP in which you can capture the packets into your Descript and then you can do something based on that or have some telemetry. Uh, other D language improvements, if statements. So I mentioned that D has the ternary operator which looks like that. Um, I don't remember what this does. Brian has a joke about it but I don't want to make that joke because it's before noon on a Saturday. Um, a real if statement would improve readability. There is now a real if statement that Mark Johnston on the FreeBSD project brought over from Illumos. Um, but what that if statement is, is just syntactic sugar, right? So when your Descript is compiled, interesting things happen. Um, so for want of an if, uh, let's just page down through this. So if this is your source, yep. If this is your source, uh, thing where you have this if string of blah, 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 blah. Um, this is looking at something ZFS. Oh, one last bracket. This is from, as an example from Matt Ahrens who did the original work. Um, you get a spoonful of syntactic sugar. Not done yet. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so what happens is that the current uh, code that takes an if and deals with it blows it out into every possible thing that the if could do. So that means there's a limitation on ifs. We're not really using the instructions that could do an if. Um, we maintain the safety via the syntactic sugar, but it also makes your scripts really uh, undebuggable, or, well, in D, let's just say far less debuggable, because D scripts are fascinating to debug. Um, but this is not the direction we're gonna go ultimately. Ultimately, we are going to put in some form of if uh, and we're also gonna put in bounded loops, right? So if we make it that the kernel defines how long your loop can run, and at the moment my inclination is 10, you get 10. There'll be a syscuttle, but the, <laughs> the initial one's gonna be 10. Um, that will be one of the things we do. Talk briefly about the audit provider. I mentioned that this was added by uh, Robert Watson. Um, so audit is a subsystem for logging security related events. A lot of the sort of like someone opened something, someone transmitted something, someone made a connection. Um, it was built originally to satisfy the government common criteria security standards, which actually, this may be the only conference where there's a majority of people who know what that is. Um, there, every other conference I go to, people are like, what? I'm like, eh, the orange book, you've heard of it, right? Nope. Um, but it's been an optional component of FreeBSD since 2004. It is also in Mac OS X. And I believe there are ports to things like Linux, but I don't know. Um, so we know what a provider is, I'll go through that. Um, but what does the provider get us? So uh, it gives us complete access to the audit framework, um, and it allows us to filter the, the, and get statistics through D. So if you just turn on audit um, in the absence of D, you're gonna get, you know, subject to which bits you set in the control block, you're gonna get all the events all the time. And for a system that wants to be a full auditing system, that's fine. But for us, we want to be able to reduce the amount of data based on a query given to us by someone who's controlling the system. In a security system, that person's called an analyst. In therapy, that person is also called an analyst. Um, but uh, you, know, you could imagine this being your DevOps type people who are like, oh, look, that set, you know, rack 25 is operating really strangely. Put uh, you know some script in there, or you know turn on something that tells us something about that. That's where audit tied with D and Dtrace really has a lot of power. Um, 
I talked about performance. Let's go into that in a little more detail. Uh, so <laughs> I love shouldn'ts in software. Yeah, this, that should be fine. That shouldn't break. That shouldn't panic, which always means it did. <laughs> right? That's, shouldn't means it did and then whoops. Um, so Dtrace should not degrade performance. Um, but as I said at the beginning of the talk, Dtrace was designed such that when it's off, it's free. And even then, it's not completely free, but it's really, really, really close to free. Um, and I mean free is in beer. Um, so the idea is that Dtrace shouldn't, shouldn't degrade performance. Um, in particular, some of the protections that exist in Dtrace exist to prevent um, a Dscript from destroying the machine. So for instance, Dtrace, uh, when it's doing its data collection in the kernel, times the collection. And if that time continues to get longer and longer, the kernel component of Dtrace will kill your Dtrace process. You'll get this, um, all error messages in D and in Dtrace are uh, not very good, um, hard to understand. So you'll get, I, I never remember the messages because they, like, I try to forget them every time I sleep. Um, but it will kick you out and it'll be like, you're, you're destroying the performance of the system, run along, have a nice day. Um, so one of the things we need to do um, is to deal with things like the fact that Dtrace will, if it's getting behind, before it kicks you out, will do things like drop records. Dropping records is not great in a debugging situation, Dropping records when you're trying to do data collection for, say, security or understanding the total transparency of a large cluster, not so great. Um, yeah, and the, the kernel can kill tracing under high load. That's the thing where the kernel just says, you need to stop. I always point upwards for user space because I don't know where it is. Um, so these are things that we have to deal with going forwards. Um, there are a couple of ways in which we can help this. Um, one of them is, I think I've put this into the head of the tree. It's definitely in the cadets code. Um, so the buffer sizes and all of the things that control how much memory DTRS can use, uh, those were sized by some people in 2004 on the biggest machines Sun could build in 2004. Um, here is an iPhone, which has more memory and probably more storage than a Sun machine did in 2004. So uh, we needed to upgrade those. And one of the things you can do is, we still leave the defaults where they were, and we'll see what I do for 12. Um, but just one of the straight up things you can do is start expanding the amount of memory that Dtrace can use to do data collection. Um, eventually it will get behind, right? I mean, eventually you will just run out of CPU or you'll run out of things. But many people in this room have, you know, minimum 64 gig or 32 gig servers that they're running in their systems. You could give a gig to, Dtrace, because the defaults are something in the megs, like it used to be, I think you couldn't blow it out past 16 megs for the number of buffers. Um, so we added that. Um, but there are other solutions. We actually have to look at, you know, we now have to look at the performance of Dtrace, um, because instead of it being used as an occasional debug tool, we'd like to see it used for a lot more. Um, I'm gonna make a brief aside into the Loom stuff. Um, so Loom is an instrumentation framework that exists using LLVM. Uh, we're using it, let's page all the way down. Um, we're using it, hopefully, uh, to put instrumentation into the programs itself. So Loom is different um, from what we do in Dtrace. Dtrace is looking at trace points and all of those things. Loom can actually look inside functions and tell you things about it. Um, the instrumentation can be done at any time as long as the IRs, I like how that just gets smaller and smaller. Um, the reason I bring up Loom is one of the improvements we've made to Dtrace was brought about by a request from the Loom folks. Um, <clears throat> we wanna be able to have um, a way of interacting between user program. We want user programs to be able to directly call a Dtrace probe. So instead of um, adding an SDT or USDT, we want to be able to call one of these probes in user space. And this was done for the Loom folks. Um, so there we go. Um, for those of you, oh, here's a good, another good demographic question. And also, I'll see if you're still awake. How many people have traced binaries in user space as opposed to the kernel? A smaller number, but not zero, which is good. 
Um, so the way user space tracing works, the way you add things currently, is um, you, know, you have a set of provider macros, uh, you have your source code, you blend them all together using the compiler and uh, the dtrace program, and then they're linked into a binary that can actually you know, be poked at uh, with dtrace. One of the other things we wanted to add was, um, right, ignoring the performance issue, um, was that the dtrace tool modifies the binaries. So by adding this system call, the binary could decide that it was gonna modify itself. Um, doesn't play well with make, and makes heavy use of relocations. So in the loom-based user land tracing, which will show up at some point, um, we don't have to use dtrace to actually um, rebuild the binary. We are actually just running the compile. Uh, normally we generate a fat binary, and then loom is the thing that glues everything together that winds up in the resulting binary. So this is early stages. It does not exist in FreeBSD yet. Um, we created this prototype system call, so there's now a DT probe system call that we have on, on our version of the OS. Um, and that allows any program that wants to, to call a dtrace probe, uh, its own dtrace probes. Um, and to be completed. Okay. So, um, when dtrace was developed, the alternatives were things like truss, ktrace, strace, um, which were generally system call tracing systems System call tracing system, that's terrible. Um, but anyway, there were system call tracing systems. They would pretty much only show you system calls. They couldn't show you all of the richness of the system that Dtrace could show you, like every function in the kernel or every function in every address in your user space program, or give you a way to um, expose the probes that you would see, uh, the kinds of probes that you now see in like the network stack and the storage stack. Um, but Dtrace is not the only one. So there's another operating system that some people use. You may have heard of it. It starts with an L. Um, so in Linux, they have something called eBPF. Um, eBPF is interesting, like the Chinese curse. Um, so at the very lowest level, eBPF operates very much like the original Berkeley packet filter, which is what BPF actually stands for. Um, it is a virtualized machine language for talking about pattern matching. And BPF was basically meant to match patterns in packets. Um, eBPF is able to match other patterns as well. Um, but, you know, when they first did this, at the lowest level, it's too primitive. Okay, so how many people have programmed an assembly language this week, besides John Baldwin? Okay, so, right. Now imagine I asked like a room full of non-kernel developers, none of you would have raised your hands. Um, so at the lowest level, eBPF is very difficult to use. You are effectively writing assembler. I mean, I think writing assembler is fun, but I have mental health issues. So um, that was fine. Then now they've added something called BCC, uh, which is a C-like front end to BPF. And then now there's PLY, which is a Python-like front end to BPF. And now they're getting towards things that like really look like something that could compete with D. Because remember, it's not just the tracing. And I'm not gonna say that any idiot can write a tracing system because that's not true, but any competent kernel programmer probably could. And I know that because there's at least four other tracing systems in FreeBSD. So clearly, more than one person can write one. Um, but remember, the power of dtrace comes from the expressiveness, or not, of the language, and so the same thing is true of our competitor, eBPF, um, and so we're pretty interested in this PLY stuff. Uh, according to Brendan Gregg, who has done a huge amount of work with actually applying dtrace and eBPF, and if you really wanna see a good talk about how to apply it, go look at Brendan's videos, um, or his book. Uh, according to Brendan, in 2017, uh, eBPF has feature parity with dtrace, so that's a problem. Um, so there is a competitor out there, and for those who believe the com competition is good, then that's a good thing, and those of us who believe that we'd like to crush everything in Linux, then that's not so good. Um, I 
won't tell you which one I am. So let's talk about how Dtrace is currently developed before I get kicked off the stage. Um, I have 14 seconds, but I'm not going to do a Watson to get, that, get done. Um, so currently, as I said, patches move back and forth um, between FreeBSD and Illumos and Mac OS. Uh, there's now a NetBSD, uh, so there's now some NetBSD support for Dtrace. I have not looked at that specifically. There's even a port to Linux. There is a Windows port of Dtrace. You can look at the code. I have no idea if it works. I just went and forked it because I was like, I don't want this to go away because it's a historical artifact. Who knows? Um, but for the most part, the patches move currently between the three actors on the upper left, FreeBSD, Illumos, macOS. The teams get along very well. We have a really good relationship with the Apple folks and with the Illumos folks. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about OpenDTrace, episode two, <laughs> A New Hope. I, I realize that I've, it's supposed to be episode four, so everyone is going to yell at me after the talk. <laughs> I know, I've seen the movies. Um, so the idea for OpenDTrace, besides the fact that it lets me do a Star Wars-like slide, um, is that we're gonna go for more cross-platform, more portability, and a more open development process. So OpenDTrace is actually a project on GitHub. Um, it's an organization on GitHub, which I think means nothing, besides that it has a container. Uh, but we started to collect together all of the uh, current implementations of Dtrace, including, <laughs> including the Linux and the Windows ones, um, and Mac OS X. So as a slight aside, if you ever want to figure out the differences between Mac OS X from 10.5 to current, I have created a full Git sort of release by release diff that you can follow, because that was the only way for me not to lose my mind again, because um, they don't actually exp you know, export their tree. So the goals of OpenDTrace are, include many of the improvements that I've talked about earlier. Um, and of course, the idea is to have a, a central place to do some work. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I'm really looking forward to is we're probably gonna target at least one embedded system with DTrace. And that's gonna be very exciting because I also have a thing for embedded systems. Um, I mentioned the OpenDTrace specification. Uh, this is to try and explain how the thing works. Um, allows us to build a better testing of the framework and support new execution substrates. We tried jitting, that didn't really help much. Um, what are we gonna do in the future? So to do an if statement, you need basic blocks. So we have to implement basic blocks, bounded loops, modules, because 2017, higher performance, um, an improved test suite. So the Sun folks did a really good test suite, um, which was great. I'm only three minutes over. Um, but that test suite is an integration test suite. So if you change something, it will tell you if you've broken like something about the scripts, but it doesn't test dtrace function by function, uh, which is what we're working on now. I mentioned more OS ports, uh, finer grain libraries, because that will make doing things like plugging it directly into Python and making Python the programming language instead of D the programming language easier. Um, again, making it usable from other languages, which will probably be, oh, I did list them. Um, if I have to do it, it's Python, Rust, and Go. If someone wants to do Perl, God be with you. Um, but I will take your code. I'm not doing that one. Um, last thing I want to talk about really, really quickly uh, is all of you raised, many of you raised your hand when I talked about debugging the kernel. What we really want to get to with the Dtrace type technologies is making it possible for people to apply them. Um, the theory that Sun had when they wrote the D language was that any sysadmin worth their salt, or probably some other even less pleasant phrase, um, would be able to take D and write analysis scripts. And the fact is that that is not really panned out. There's been a subset of very good sysadmins and programmers who can do it, but we want to make that easier. So <clears throat> more kernel trace points, well, that's, that's for us in the room, um, like IPsec, network link layer, geom drivers. But what we want to do is start building user space tools. Um, so SCEDGraph is something that um, Jeff Roberson did years ago. Very good about figuring out what's going on with the scheduler. We want to be able to do lock graphing. We want to be able to look at the performance of various subsystems. We want to actually apply it because that will get people to use it more. Uh, and then flame graph all the things because people really love flame graphs. So um, this is our goal, is that there will be a single upstream called OpenDTrace. It will be consumed by macOS, Illumos, FreeBSD, NetBSD, Linux, Windows, and others. Um, 
We are not changing the license, so the Linux people are going to go, meh, and they have eBPF. But, you know, they had ButterFS, too, and that didn't work out for them. So we'll see what happens in the long run. Thank you very much.